Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. The uh, topic of today's video is the special theory of relativity. Uh, we're not going to do the entire theory in one day, but the reason I put this at this point in the course is you just finished lesson four where we were talking about uh, relative motion and frames of reference. And this is kind of like the ultimate analysis of relative motion and frames of reference. The idea in the special theory of relativity is that when you view motion from uh, different frames of reference, of course it looks different the way we learned in chapter 1.5. But think of this thought, which maybe never has occurred to you before. The way you perceive the universe is through information that comes to you in the form of light, really. If you think about it, uh, you see things around you because visible light waves come to you. Uh, even if you don't see things, even if you hear about things halfway around the world, uh, that could be because of radio communication, which actually is radio waves transmitting information. Uh, maybe someone calls you on their phone, a cell phone, and now microwaves are transmitting information. The point I'm trying to make here is that all the information that you have about the world around you, or at least most of it, comes to us in the form of what we call electromagnetic radiation or light, either visible or radio or microwave or whatever, and all of that information travels at the so-called speed of light. In fact, there's no way to get information faster than the speed of light, and so some people uh, like to pose the question, maybe you've heard this one before, if the sun burned out now, when would we find out about it? And if you do a little research online and a little calculations, you'll find that because the sun is so far away from us, and because its light travels to us at, obviously, the speed of light, therefore, how long would it take the last bit of light to get to Earth after the sun burned out? If you do this calculation, you'll find out it's about eight minutes. So that means, even if the sun burned out right now, we would continue receiving light. We would think that the sun still existed for eight more minutes before everything went dark. And so you might wonder, well, is it possible to get a warning in advance? Like, could we put a spaceship close to the sun, just keeping track of things, and if the sun ever went out, it could quickly send a signal to us, warning us that we only had eight more minutes of light? Well, this is impossible, because how would the spaceship send the information? Well, thinking about it, it would send it probably as a radio message, which travels at the speed of light, the same speed as the visible light that is coming from the sun. So there's actually... A, a space and time interplay going on here. And when you, when you really think about how we understand the world, you start to realize that we totally depend on the finite, not infinite, speed of light. So where the uh, theory of relativity gets interesting is when you start moving relative to some event at near the speed of light, you start traveling at a speed which is comparable to the speed at which the information is coming to you, and now things start to behave really weird. Uh, you start perceiving the world differently than if you were just at rest in the same frame of reference as these events. What might these events be? Well, they could be anything. It could be you observing the sun. It could be you watching someone fly by on a spaceship. It could be you as an astronomer on Earth watching a distant galaxy moving through space at a very high speed. In other words, our view of the universe is highly dependent on our speed relative to other objects and events, and it becomes extremely important as we near the speed of light. That, in a nutshell, is what Einstein's theory is about. And so today, here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the interesting fact that the speed of light is constant for all observers in the universe. And as a result of this, we run into these interesting effects that I just hinted at. Uh, Einstein made two postulates, two proposals, two ideas that he wanted to use to get started in his special theory of relativity. We're going to go over those and see why they're important. And then we're going to look at the consequences of his two postulates. Now, there are many consequences. One of them is called time dilation, and that's the only one we're going to look at today. In fact, we're going to leave some of the other ones. The other ones are called, for example, length contraction or relativistic momentum or E equals mc squared. We're going to leave that for a future lesson. Today we're just going to talk about time dilation because that'll be enough, believe me. And then at the end of time dilation, 
you're going to wonder, okay, this sounds really cool, but is it for real? And so I'm going to provide you with some evidence, uh, real life evidence that yes, what we've just described is real. So just before we dive into everything, here we are in lesson five. The sections in the schedule are 11.1 and 11.2. Please, after watching the video, take a look at those, take some notes, and look at the sample problems. A couple of videos. One that I'm going to focus on today is time dilation. You should also watch the one called simultaneity. A few questions that we'll try in class, and then some questions for you to try afterwards, and some suggested research that you might want to do if you find this sort of thing interesting. All right. I also have a book in class. Uh, it's called Conceptual Physics by an author named Paul Hewitt. And if you want to read that, it gives you an excellent discussion of uh, special theory of relativity in a non-mathematical way. So it's quite easy to, uh, to grasp if you want to get away from the math. Okay, here we go. So Einstein's two postulates that lead to the special theory of relativity. Uh, what are they and what are their consequences? Well, the first thing that Einstein said is he proposed that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames of reference. Now you just finished uh, learning about frames of reference. The word inertial in terms of inertial frame of reference just means frames of reference moving at a constant velocity relative to one another. It's basically what we've been discussing in class. So for example, imagine you are at an airport and you're having a cup of coffee or you're in a restaurant and the waiter comes over and you say, can I have a cup of coffee? And he pours you a waiter. Uh, pours you a waiter. <laughs> he pours you a cup of coffee. Hopefully, he doesn't pour you a waiter. That would be very strange. Uh, meanwhile, later on in the day, you're going to get on an airplane and you're going to go flying through the air at hundreds of miles an hour. And uh, maybe you want another coffee. And so the steward or the stewardess comes up and you say, "Can I please have a cup of coffee?" And he pours you one there as well. Now, in both cases, you were moving or you were at a constant velocity in the airport constant velocity, zero meters per second relative to the ground. In the airplane, maybe 500 miles per hour relative to the ground. Here's my question to you. As a result of the fact that you're moving very fast relative to the ground once you're in the airplane, does that change the way in which coffee that's being poured and is therefore falling into your cup behaves? In other words, if you think about it, coffee being poured is actually kind of behaving like a projectile. It's said all of the molecules are falling through the air. And therefore, there's a certain physics to that projectile motion, which we've also studied in the course. Do you think the coffee pourer has to change his or her pouring technique when you're on the airplane versus when you are in the airport? The answer, of course, is no, so long as the airplane isn't jerking around through the air with a lot of turbulence. As long as the airplane is moving at constant velocity relative to the ground, in other words, it is what we call an inertial frame of reference, the pouring of coffee is exactly the same in the sky as it is on the ground. More generally, the laws of physics are the same in both of these frames of reference. And so Einstein just comes out and says this, physics should be the same for anyone moving at constant velocity relative to one another. There shouldn't be any preferred or special frame of reference. His postulate number two <clears throat> is a little deeper than that, and it deals with the idea that if the speed of light is known, and we, by the way, know it, you may remember this from grade uh, 11, remember the value, it's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. If this is the speed of light, and if you believe in frames of reference affecting the speed at, of, uh, the speed at which people measure um, the motion of objects, then you might wonder to yourself, in what frame of reference is the speed of light equal to this value? I mean, for example, if you are on this airplane and you have a flashlight, let me put you literally on the airplane, I think we mean in the airplane, but anyway, you're on the airplane and you have a flashlight in your hand. Here's my best rendition of a flashlight, and you turn it on and a beam of light shoots forward at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But you are on an airplane which itself is moving through the air relative to the ground. It might be moving, I don't know, let me just pick a number here, 200 meters per second. Now I know these numbers are very different here, but if I'm standing on the ground 
at the airport watching you go by, if I measure the speed of your beam of light, will it be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second plus the 200 that the plane is moving at? It seems logical if you think about all of the stuff we've learned about frames of reference and relative velocities, then yes, you would add the two velocities in this case. Well, here we are talking about the speed of light and all these years you've been told that this is the value. Well, in what frame of reference? Clearly not in the airplane frame of reference, if you believe my proposal here, my argument about having to add the two velocities. In what frame of reference is the speed of light this? Well, up until the uh, beginning of the 1900s, scientists had to have some frame of reference in which the speed of light was 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. After all, our understanding of electricity and magnetism depended on that. And so they wondered, well, in what frame of reference? I mean, we do all our experiments here on Earth, and so I've given you a nice little picture of Earth here. But wait a minute, Earth is in constant motion orbiting the Sun. For that matter, what if you go to Mercury to do a little bit of physics? It's on a different orbit at a different speed. So is Venus, Mars, and all the other planets, the Moon as well. In what frame of reference is the speed of light this? Is it only on Earth? For that matter, Earth is spinning on its axis. On one side of the Earth, you're moving one direction. On the other side of the Earth, you're moving another direction. Could two scientists do an experiment involving the speed of light They'd be in different places on Earth. Maybe one is in North America, one is in Europe. What are they going to use in their calculations for the speed of light? Everything's going to get all screwy here. So, enter two scientists. Michelson and Morley are their last names. And they do an experiment involving a device that I'm not going to get into too much here. I'm just going to give you a brief idea of how it works. It's called an interferometer. Now, an interferometer, as the name suggests, has something to do with the word interference. And it's interference of light is what this machine or this device analyzes. Imagine there's light entering this device. There's something called a beam splitter, which is a device that allows some of the light to pass through. That's this way here. But it also reflects some of the light. It's kind of like a partially reflective mirror. You can see that a beam splitter will split one beam of light into two so that it travels along different paths. At the end of each path is a mirror which reflects the light back toward the beam splitter. And the beam splitter once again allows some of the light straight through and the rest on the other beam it reflects so that it enters a detector over here. Now if you think back to grade 11 physics what this means is that light waves that are initially together are going to be split up to move along different paths and they're going to rejoin down here. Now when light waves, like any waves, rejoin, they interfere either constructively or destructively. So this device is going to lead to interference of light waves, which if you think about it, will mean bright and dark regions where the light interferes constructively, that would be the bright regions, or destructively would be the dark regions. Now we will study this later on in the course, but for now, I think you might have some fuzzy idea of what this is about from grade 11 when you studied waves. Okay? Now, getting back to the interferometer, the idea is this. If you are doing this experiment, and if you are on Earth, you are moving in some direction through space. Which means that there's got to be some frame of reference where the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. You're going to be moving relative to this frame of reference. No matter what, you're going to be moving in some direction at some speed at any given time of day. As a result, the speed of light along these two different paths has got to be different because the light has been split into two completely different paths. Therefore, the light will travel by different amounts and therefore when it rejoins down here it will interfere either constructively or destructively. Furthermore, if you take this whole device and you rotate it around during your experiment, put it on a swivel table and rotate it, the type of interference should change as the different paths get oriented differently to this supposed frame of reference in which the speed of light is the magical 
3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Well, scientists have a name <clears throat> for this magical frame of reference in which the speed of light is this number. They had it, they called it the ether. I don't know why they called it the ether. Uh, you'd have to look that up. But it was supposedly this, this magical frame of reference that was supposed to be the ultimate at rest frame of reference in the universe. The frame of reference in which the speed of light was this number. And therefore, on Earth, as we move through the universe, we must be moving relative to the frame of reference. We ought to observe changes in the interference pattern as we rotate this device. Well, guess what? To make a long story even longer, they never observed any change in the interference pattern, which suggested that this idea of a frame of reference where the speed of light was this, there only being one frame of reference, it was a bogus idea. There was no one frame of reference where the speed of light was this. The, frame, the, the speed of light is actually equal to this in every frame of reference. The speed of light is the same for all inertial or what we call constant velocity observers. Remember the word inertial refers to constant velocity. If you're moving at a constant velocity relative to someone else, both of you observe the same speed of light. So getting back to our airplane example, here's the shocking truth. You get on the airplane and you turn on your beam of light, you measure this speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8. Even though you're on a plane moving at 200 meters per second passing me on Earth at the airport, guess what I measure for your beam of light? Not the speed of light plus the speed of your plane, the way you've been taught in section 1.5 with relative motion, but the same speed. In other words, everything I just taught you about the, the relative velocities in section 1.5 is kind of not true. But, as you're going to see, it seems to work well when we do it with everyday calculations. Like if you think back to the Mythbusters video, remember the Japanese Mythbusters where they launched the ball off of a truck, they launched it backwards, the velocity seemed to add up according to this sort of addition and we got the right result. The ball fell straight down. It was motionless in the air for a brief moment. However, close to the speed of light or when dealing with light, this simply isn't true. So Einstein postulates two things. Once again, the laws of physics are the same in all frames of reference, inertial frames of reference, and the speed of light is the same for all inertial observers. There is no ether frame of reference. All right, moving along. What is the consequence of this? Well, what I'd like you to do right now is pause the video when I finish this uh, little part here and go to one of the videos on YouTube that's in your homework schedule. It's this one, Time Dilation, Albert Einstein and the Theory of Relativity, and watch it. Okay, Watch this several times. It's only a minute and a bit. Come back when you're done. Okay, welcome back. You've just seen the video where they argued that the beam of light takes more time to go from one ship to another if you're viewing this from somewhere outside these ships. But it takes less time if you are in the frame of reference of the ships. Now your textbook, so this is in the Nelson 12 book, uh, Physics 12 by Nelson. I've taken one of their pictures. This is a similar scenario. In scenario A, they ask you to imagine that you are a, uh, an astronaut on a spaceship and you're going to have what's called a light clock you're going to send a beam of light up from this, the floor to the ceiling. There's a mirror that's going to bounce it back down again. Uh, it's kind of like the light beam bouncing between the two ships in the video that you just watched. You are going to be in the frame of reference of the beam of light, so you measure a time for the beam to go up and down. You simply do this by knowing the speed of light and the distance that it travels. You'd have an idea of the time. Meanwhile, someone else watching you fly by from another frame of reference will see the light beam travel on a diagonal path much the same way it did in the video that you just watched. All right. Now, as a result of this, according to the video, the person outside of your frame of reference is going to measure a longer time. What we're going to do now is, de is derive the formula that actually relates the time that you measure and the book calls this delta T S. The S stands for stationary, which is to say that even though you are moving in a spaceship as you fly past your friendly observer, the other observer, 
you are stationary relative to the event. You are in the frame of reference of the event. And what is the event? The event is very simply a beam of light going up and back down again. Your friend, the other observer, watches you move by. So this person measures a delta T M, where the M stands for moving, which is to say that the event that your friend is watching is moving relative to him or her. Okay? Don't get the M mixed up and think that it goes in here because this person's moving. It refers to whether you are moving or at rest relative to the event, which in this case is the simple bouncing of a beam of light. Now, to save a bit of time, what I've done is I've done a little screenshot, which I'm going to add in now for some of the math that's going on here. Just give my computer a chance to catch up. I believe it is right here. Yep, there we go. Just going to add this in. I did this before so I could save you a little bit of time. All right, so here we go. You see that down here at the bottom, if we look at just half of the trip for the light to go up and down, it forms a right angle triangle. The right angle triangle is in here. Now, let's look at this carefully. The ship is moving horizontally. Whoops, that's not very horizontal. Let me get myself a straight line. The, hor the ship is moving horizontally to the right, and it's moving at a speed past u of v. So you watch it go by. You are watching a ship that is moving. How far does it move? Speed times time, v delta t, but you are measuring the speed. You are watching a moving thing, a moving event, so v times delta t m. That's this side of the triangle. Meanwhile, the astronaut in the ship watches the light beam go up and down, and this person knows that she's dealing with light, so the speed is c, and the time that she measures, she's in the frame of reference, so that's delta t s. She is stationary with respect to this event. So she measures this distance, and that of course leaves the hypotenuse. What is its distance? Now here's the shocker. Many of you would be, I could forgive you if you said, well hold on a minute, you're on a ship that's moving this way at a speed v, velocity v, and the light beam is going up and down at a speed or velocity c. I learned in relative motion in section 1.5 that the combined velocity, you got to do vector addition, you're going to use Pythagorean theorem to find the magnitude of the speed along the horizontal, or rather the diagonal path here. You'd be, you'd be doing the square root of v squared plus c squared. You would argue to me if you were still thinking along the lines of section 1.5 in the textbook, that this is the speed of light greater than c, where c is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But guess what? Even though that's what we learned in section 1.5, that you add velocities, this is incorrect according to Einstein, because remember Einstein's postulate, the speed of light is the same for all inertial observers. In other words, it doesn't matter how you're moving, as long as it's at constant velocity, everybody observes the same speed for the speed of light. So this idea is incorrect, and therefore the speed is still c, and the time that you measure as you see the light beam take that diagonal path, once again, is a delta t m. So that's where all of this comes from. Now let me just get a little bit more space here. Oops. Pardon me, I'm just going to try to do a little bit of quick erasing. There we go. Okay, so <clears throat> what's going on here? We have a right angle triangle. Square this, square that, add them, you get this squared, Pythagorean theorem. That's the first line here. I hope all of you can see why, where this line comes from. I'm going to rearrange the terms a little bit so that all the delta t m's are on one side and the delta t s is on the other side. Then I've got squaring of delta t m, squaring of delta t m. I'm going to pull that out as a common factor, leaving behind the c, which is squared, the v, which is squared, and a subtraction. Now I'm going to divide both sides by c squared minus v squared, and I get to here. 
Now here's where the math gets a uh, little bit of little bit trickier than normal, so I'm going to pick it up here. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to divide the top by c squared, and I'm going to divide the bottom by c squared, which is legal in math. Whatever you do to the top, you can do to the bottom. So what's that going to give me? Expanding this bracket out to c squared delta t s squared divided by c squared all over c squared over c squared minus v squared over c squared equals delta tm squared. What am I going to get here? Well, these guys cancel. These guys cancel and give you a 1, and that leaves you with this. And so now, if I just take the square root of both sides, I'm going to get to my final equation, which is going to say delta tm equals 1 over, sorry, delta ts, let me try this again, delta tm equals, I've got delta ts squared square rooted, so that's going to be delta ts over square root of 1 minus v over c, both of them squared. And this, my friends, is what we call the time dilation equation. Now let's have a look at it for a second. It tells us actually the time dilation equation is right there, not this part here. Let me just erase that. What is this telling us? It's telling us that the time measured by an observer in motion relative to an event is not the same as the time measured by someone who's in the frame of reference of the event. So this is the time if you are in the frame of reference of the event. Delta Ts is the time that you measure. We call this the proper time, which is not to say that it's the correct time, as in proper, just proper as in in the frame of reference of the event. And so delta Tm is any other observer who is in motion relative to the event. A couple of important things. First of all, 1 minus the speed that you're moving at divided by the speed of light, this number down here will always be less than 1, which means your denominator will always be less than 1, which means you're going to have a delta Tm that's greater than delta Ts. In other words, observers watching a moving event measure longer times than observers in the frame of reference of the event. Or, as the video suggests, moving clocks run slow. If you are, let's say, down just to give an example that we had talked about, if you're down here sipping a cup of coffee and you watch your friend fly by sipping a cup of coffee, your friend looks at her watch and she measures a time delta Ts because she is stationary relative to the drinking of the coffee. But you measure a delta Tm because you are watching her move. Guess what? According to this equation that we just derived, you will measure the drinking of the coffee to take longer than she will, which is really, really weird. Does that mean she's drinking in slow motion? Well, you'll see her drink in slow motion, yes but she will be in the frame of reference of the drinking of the coffee, and so she won't notice anything different or strange or unusual. To her, the drinking of the coffee seems totally normal. There's other mathematical consequences here, and I'm going to go to these in just a sec. All right, here we go. Let's take a look at that equation one more time. We had delta t stationary equals, sorry, delta t m equals delta t stationary over the root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So, first consequence. Uh, we got a square root sign here, and as you know, you cannot have a square root of a negative number. You can only have a zero or a positive underneath the square root sign. So in other words, everything in there 
1 minus v squared over c squared must be greater than or equal to 0. That's just math, right? Well, let's work with this for a sec. That means 1 is greater than or equal to uh, sorry, v squared over c squared, just bringing this across to the other side. And now I'm going to do this. I'm going to multiply both sides by c squared. And then I'm going to take square root of both sides. And uh, what do we get? Well, this would seem to suggest that the speed that you move at must be less than or equal to the speed of light. In other words, you can never go higher than the speed of light. You could go at the speed of light or less than the speed of light. But wait, this is in the denominator. So the idea of a zero is out of the question. You can't have a zero in the denominator, so this, forget it. This has to be a positive, which means this has to be greater than zero, greater than zero, greater than zero, greater than zero. So actually, to be more specific, the speed that an object moves at must be less than the speed of light. And this is a, something that you've probably heard quite often. You can't go faster than the speed of light. Well, you can't even go at the speed of light. According to Einstein's derivation here, you must travel less than the speed of light. And sure enough, no one has ever been able to accelerate anything, even tiny little particles in a particle accelerator, up to the speed of light, let alone beyond the speed of light. So, this puts a sort of cosmic speed limit on things in the universe, and if we look further at this equation, let's see what starts to happen when you try to go faster and faster. So what I've done here is made up a little chart. Suppose your speed is zero. Then zero divided by c, the speed of light, would be obviously zero. Now, let's forget about the delta t s that you see in this formula and the delta t m. Let's just focus in on the one divided by the square root symbol for a moment, because that's really the thing that's changing depending on your speed. And in physics, they give that the Greek letter gamma. Gamma is the letter for the 1 over the square root 1 minus v over c squared part of the formula. So let's see how gamma behaves as the speed v changes. You would end up with 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared would be 0 over c. You notice I've put the squaring into brackets because they're both being squared, right? Uh, what's that give you? 1 over the root of 1 minus 0. Well, that's just 1 over 1, which is 1. So at a speed of 0, the gamma value is 0. Okay, fair enough. What if your speed is really fast, like 50% of the speed of light? 0.5 times c. So now we would have v over c is 0.5c over c for a ratio of 0 0.5. Let's sub that into the gamma equation. <clears throat> we'll get 1 minus 0.5c over c squared. And what's that going to give us? Well, first of all, good news, the c's cancel. It'll be 1 over the root of 1 minus 0.5 squared. And if you run this through your calculator, which I recommend you do to make sure you're punching these numbers incorrectly, you get 1.15. So on this scale here, going all the way from a speed of 0 relative to the speed of light up to a half the speed of light, which is extremely fast, no one's ever gone this fast before, the value climbs not even up to 2, it just goes up to like 15% higher. So let me put that in here. That's not very impressive. Let's go really fast. Let's go 0.9 times the speed of light, 90% the speed of light, so that our v over c value is 0.9, so that when we plug this into the gamma function, we've got 1 minus 0.9 squared. What's that going to give us? Surely going at the speed of light, we're really going to see a big pop in this uh, gamma function, and it starts to get a little bit bigger. 2.29 is what you should get on your calculator. Okay, so we're well above 2. We're now somewhere, if this is 2 over here, 
then at point 0.9c we are up to about here. Let's try even more extreme speeds. You know, you hear people say, what would happen if you could travel at 99% the speed of light? Well, then your v over c would be 0.99. This would be 1 over the root of 1 minus 0.99 squared. What's this going to do for your gamma function? It comes to 7.09. So pretty much off the charts, way up here. So at 0.99c, which I can barely draw in here, you're going to be way up here. For those of you who've taken advanced functions, or even functions and relations, I think you know there's a vertical asymptote forming at a value of speed of light equal to c, and that is because you can't go the speed of light. This is a denominator of zero is what you would get. So to fill in all of the, uh, all of the points here, I'll see if I can do this. I'm not very good at drawing lines. You know that's why I'm a physics teacher and not an artist. And this is what the function looks like. So basically, what this is saying is that even at a half the speed of light, you only get about a 15% difference between the time that you measure if you are on a spaceship watching something happen, and the time that's measured if you are, let's say, on Earth watching the spaceship fly by and watching something happen. And furthermore, I've got to go plug in here, so... I'm going to take my computer somewhere where I can get some power. Furthermore, if you go at 90% the speed of light, you get only about two times the time difference. So, for example, if an event took one minute on the spaceship, it would take just over two minutes as observed from outside the spaceship. You really have to be going at least 90%, even faster, the speed of light in order to get really noticeable effects for uh, what we call relativistic effects for this thing called time dilation. And so while we're at it, what does time dilation mean? It refers to the fact that time is getting stretched out. Time is moving slower. It's kind of like this lecture, which is going on and on. Uh, I apologize, but this is a tricky concept, and it has a lot of details that we have to talk about. But time seems to stretch out when you're moving fast, when you're observing something that's moving very fast, relative to you. Now, let's uh, try to speed things along a little bit and look at an example in the textbook. This is done uh, for you, but I'd like to just show you how they do it because you might find this a little confusing otherwise. It's sample problem one in the textbook and they talk about an astronaut whose pulse, so his heartbeat, is constant at 72 beats per minute. He goes on a voyage, so he goes on a, on a little trip out to wherever. Um, what would his pulse be relative to Earth if the ship were moving at the following speeds? So, in the first example, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say if his heart is beating at 72 beats per minute, let's imagine one beat of the heart as an event. Think of it that way. Okay? So now the, the, uh, the astronaut is on a ship. And let's imagine that you are here on Earth. And you are watching the ship go by. Here's my best rendition of a spaceship. There we go. It's flying through space. And somewhere on here is the astronaut. And here you are on Earth. And you are watching an event, the beating of his heart. Well, at 72 beats per minute, that would be 1 divided by 72 seconds per beat. And if I take my calculator here and I do 1 divided by 72, I get something like 0 0.0138 repeating seconds for each beat. And if you do that 72 times, it takes up uh, a, a minute. Sorry, this is 172 of a minute. <clears throat> not second. That would be 72 beats per second, which would be pretty crazy. Okay, now um, this is what he's observing. So since he is in the frame of reference of the heartbeat, obviously, because it's within his body, that is a delta T s that is being measured. 
0.0138 repeating of a minute. But you, watching a move at some speed v, you're going to measure a time delta t m for this. Now your textbook takes you through the actual calculation, and I guess to save time now, let's go see what they do. So here we are. I believe I have this right here. Here's the sample problem coming up. Okay, there we go. So here's what they were doing. You see I just did the same thing. This is the number of minutes per beat, per event. At the speed of 0.1c, we sub 0.1c into the formula. We cancel out the c's. We do the math that we were just doing ourselves when we were taking a look at these calculations here. And it turns out that the beat which you measured to take 0.014 minutes to two sig figs is also 0.014 minutes. So in other words, even at a very high speed of 0.1c, 10% the speed of light, you really don't notice much of a difference between the events, either viewed in the frame of reference of the event or on Earth. But what happens if you move, or if he moves past you at 90% the speed of light? Now, that event, which only took 0.014 minutes, takes 0.032 minutes, and 0.032 minutes is actually about, well, not about, but exactly, here's 0.9c in our chart, 2.29 times longer. So the heartbeats are taking longer, which means he's going to have fewer beats per second. If you now take the reciprocal of this, you can find out that the number, the beat frequency, is 31 beats per minute. Now this leads to something even more profound. If the guy's heart is beating at a slower rate, does that mean he lives longer? Well, actually, you do age at a slower rate if you are moving at a high speed relative to someone else. So some people say, well, can I get on a spaceship and live longer by traveling through space? And well, the answer is kind of yes and no. If you were to be in this spaceship that was traveling at the speed, or close to the speed of light past Earth, then people on Earth would observe your heart to beat slower, and therefore you would seem to stay alive a lot longer than they would. In fact, they'd all die eventually, and their, their, uh, their, their sons and daughters who were now taking over the job of watching your heartbeat would still see you with a heartbeat, still see you alive. But keep in mind, all motion is relative. The same astronaut would look back at you on Earth and see you going in the opposite direction at the same speed. Motion is relative, right? And so the person on board would see your heartbeat doing the same thing. They would measure a delta TM of you, and therefore there would be time dilation. Now, you both can't be aging slower than one another, so who's right? Well, for an interesting discussion of this, take a look in your textbook under what's called the twin trip, or the twin paradox. And they don't talk too much about it here, but it is quite interesting. Can you stay young by traveling at very high speeds relative to other people? Uh, check it out. I want to leave you with something to do, and I also don't want this video to get any longer than it already is. Okay? Uh, just going back, a few final things. Is this all for real, or is it really just fancy math? Uh, well, I got news for you. It is real. There have been experiments done that have proven that this effect, time dilation, really does exist. One experiment involves highly accurate atomic clocks that are on board airplanes. These airplanes were taken, uh, they were flown around the world actually, and they had atomic clocks on them that were synchronized with atomic clocks that were left on Earth. And the question was, does the movement of the airplane and the clock result in the clock ticking slower when the two atomic clocks are compared with one another after the airplane lands? And in fact, the clock that was on board the, sh the airplane came back, it had ticked fewer times, it was further behind, it was slower than the clock that was left on Earth. So do a uh, Google search or some search for a verification of the special theory of relativity involving atomic clocks on airplanes and read about it. Very, very cool. Uh, there's a couple of others. If you know a little bit about particle physics, you know that 
particle physicists smash particles together to see uh, what happens when, when they break into little pieces. And they do this in what are called particle accelerators that speed up particles to very nearly the speed of light. In these particle accelerators, therefore, they have to use the equations of special relativity in order to predict what's going to happen. Sure enough, it turns out that the predictions of special relativity for these particles are correct. The particles behave near the speed of light as one would expect from the time dilation equation. So check out particle accelerators and special theory of relativity. And one final one involves a particle called a muon. There are these particles that are actually produced in our upper atmosphere when, uh, when <clears throat> atomic, uh, sorry, when uh, cosmic rays impact some of the particles in our upper atmosphere. They have very high energy collisions, and something called a muon can be produced. Now these muons go flying down toward the surface of Earth, and in doing so, uh, one might expect that they hit us on the earth, on the ground, but on the other hand, scientists know that muons actually decay. They are not stable particles, and in fact, they don't live very long after they're created. They should decay and actually never make it to the surface of the earth in the time between when they are created and when they've traveled toward the uh, surface. But in fact, they do reach the surface. They don't decay because they are traveling so fast relative to us on Earth that time dilation keeps them, quote, alive long enough to hit the Earth. So check these three out. Do a bit of research on your own to see that time dilation has been confirmed. It is for real. Try some of the problems in the book. I apologize for the length of the video, but I hope you see that it's a lot of detail to cover. And it's also very interesting and a very rich topic. And I hope you'll do a little bit more investigation on your own. All right, we will do some work in class to help you understand how to do the problems. Thanks for watching, folks. Have a great day. See you later.